Well, we'll make the best of it. All right, we're just going to have to get started and hope for the best on that. Okay, so welcome back. Um, hopefully, uh, the video here will work okay and the picture will be good for those of you out in TV land. Uh, so we are back for, oh, I guess this is chapter six, but episode seven uh, of supercomputing in plain English. This is distributed multiprocessing. Um, so we're going to get our introduction to MPI this week. All the usual disclaimers. It's an experiment. Mute yourself. Download the slides. If you had, if you had downloaded the slides before uh, late this morning or lunchtime today, uh, you may want to re-download them because I uploaded a new version with some additional hot off the presses benchmarking data. Um, if you can use Zoom, we recommend that you do use this particular Zoom session. Uh, we think you'll get the best outcome out of that. Um, otherwise, YouTube, Twitch, Wowza, uh, the phone bridge only if you have to. We are dialed in. Uh, mute yourself. Questions, go to supercomputing in plain English. That's all one word at gmail.com. Uh, talent release. Uh, so important thing, next week and the week after, uh, I'm away. Well, next week I'm away on business travel. The week after, I just didn't think it was fair to hold a session during spring break here to you. Uh, so we'll be out two weeks in a row, and then we'll pick up again at the end of March, the last Tuesday in March. Um, thanks to all the folks who are helping. This is an experiment. Exciting upcoming things. All right, so now we're ready. Are we ready for the fun? Oh, right. okay. So we're going to have fun. We're going to have fun. All right, so this is an analogy that will capture everything important about distributed multiprocessing with nothing left out. Do you believe me? Okay, I'm glad you believe me. All right, one person in the audience believes me. So, here's the scenario. Oh, it's your turn to volunteer. You didn't know that when you came, right? What is your favorite island, yeah, you, your favorite island vacation getaway? What island do you want to have a vacation on? Sure. Okay. <laughs> You're a, uh, we'll say the big island, right? Okay. So you, you, yeah. you go on vacation to Hawaii, uh, you're on a beautiful big island, you got a lovely bungalow there, and uh, in the bungalow you have some stuff. You've got a desk, you've got a chair, so that's good, um, and on the desk you've got a phone, a calculator, a pencil, and two sheets of paper. The first sheet of paper is a list of instructions, what to do. And the second sheet of paper is a table of numbers, what to do it to. Does that make sense? So far it's good? So it's not a very good vacation, but there you are on vacation in Hawaii. Okay. And the instructions kind of fall into two flavors. There's the sort of instructions that we're used to up to this point, the standard kind of instructions where, okay, take the number in slot 18, add it to the number in slot 291, put the result in slot 857, right? That's a fairly generic sort of thing one might do, or compare the number in slot 71 to the number in slot 56, and if they're equal, then do this thing, but otherwise do that thing, right? Um, so that should be fairly, uh, we've done that kind of stuff in programming up until now. But the other kind of instruction is new and exciting and weird, and it is pick up the phone and dial 555-0017 and leave a voicemail, and in the voicemail, all you're going to say is the number that's in slot 327, okay? Or pick up the phone and call your voicemail, voicemail, and get a voicemail um, from 555-0044, and that voicemail will just be a number, put that number in slot 45. So press it good? Everything's good, right? You can do everything I've described up till now, right? So, based on what I've described, do you know the nature, meaning, and purpose of the instructions that you're following? Shake your head louder with your mouth. No, no you don't. Do you know who you're leaving voicemails for? No. no, you don't. Do you know who's leaving voicemails for you? No. no, you don't. In order to do the task, in order to follow the instructions, do you need to know it? No. Okay. So you can do all of the instructions that you've been given perfectly well with no idea why you're doing them, um, what the goal is, uh, who you're communicating. 
It'll all still work fine, even though you know none of that. So far, so good? Okay. All right. So, Matt, Travis, it's your turn. What's your favorite island vacation getaway? Where? What island do you want to go to to get a vacation? Coco Cay. Coco Cay. Okay, so you go there. You have a bungalow. In the bungalow, you've got your desk and your chair. On the desk, you have the pencil, the calculator, the telephone, two sheets of paper. What's on the first sheet of paper? Instructions. Instructions. What's on the second sheet of paper? Say it again. Number. Numbers, data, exactly correct, good. Okay, so you've got the instructions that make you look add numbers together, but then you've got the instructions for the leaving and getting voicemails, right? Based on what we've described, same rules as I described for her, based on what we've described, you know the nature, purpose, and meaning of the instructions that you're following. No, you don't. Do you know who you're leaving voicemails for? No, you don't. Do you know who's leaving voicemails for you? No, you don't. So, but can you get your work done even though you don't know any of that? Sure. Okay, your turn. What's your favorite island vacation getaway? Andaman. Andaman, okay. So you've got your bungalow with your desk and your chair on the desk. You have the calculator, pencil, telephone, two sheets of paper. What's on the first sheet of paper? Instructions on the second sheet of paper is? Numbers, the data, very good. Okay, so you're doing calculations, but you're also leaving voicemails for people, and people are leaving voicemails for you. Do you know the nature, purpose, and meaning of the instructions you're following? Do you know why you're doing it? Based on what I've described. Okay, why are you doing it? See, you don't know. Do you know who you're leaving voicemails for? No, do you know who's leaving voicemails for you? So far so good, okay? Nobody knows anything, and yet you're all being productive. So far so good? Yeah, okay, we're happy, okay. Suppose the person who set up the instructions that each of you has, suppose the phone number that that person is having you call, and you don't know who it was who set them up, but so those are the phone numbers that that person is having you call, those phone numbers were you and you and you. So you are calling her and her. You are calling her and him. You are calling him and her, okay? Could that be the case? Could it be that you're calling each other? Okay, so far so good? Okay. Um, could it be that the person who set up the original instructions and the original piece of paper with data could that person be sufficiently clever that unbeknownst to any of you, the three of you are actually working together to solve a much bigger problem than any one of you could do on your own? Could that be true if that person were clever enough? Nod your head louder with your mouth. Yeah. yeah, that could totally be true. The three of you could be calling each other and working each on a piece of a much bigger problem. Right? Is that exciting? Okay. Now, by the way, can you see his sheet of data? Can you see his numbers? No. Can you see her numbers? Can you see his numbers? Can you see her numbers? Can you see her numbers? Can you see her numbers? Oh. So everybody can only see their own numbers. All of your data is private. Yes, question from the audience. The audience says that the audio is not loud enough. The audio is not loud enough. I have it on the next to highest setting. So the only thing I can do at this stage is to shout louder, okay? So, I, and I will, I will shout louder, but I've got the lapel mic and we've got the in-room mics, and this is literally the best I can do. Okay, now, so if there is a reason for one of your numbers to be known by him, what's the only way to get that number to him? Yeah, you've got to leave him a voicemail. And if there's a need for you to see one of her numbers, what's the only way for you to get that number? Well, she's got to give it to you, right? So she has to call and leave you a voicemail, and then you have to go collect the voicemail. So the only way for the three of you to exchange or share or look, be able to see each other's data is through voicemails. So far, so good? Okay. Now, every call you make is two different charges, okay? Um, so some of you may be old enough to remember a service that used to have commercials on TV called 10, 10, 220. Does anybody remember 10, 10, 220? Okay, Debbie is the only one in the room. Remember, okay, so Debbie and I are of a different generation, perhaps. I'm sort of surprised, Jim, because you're about my age. 10, 10, 220, where it was a super cheap form of long distance calling back when long distance calling was really expensive. So like the 1980s. Back in the 1980s, 
long distance calls. Uh, if you had a good long distance plan on your landline phone, because we didn't have these newfangled, well, if you wanted to pay an enormous amount of money, you could get um, this giant phone that weighed about as much as a brick um, and you could carry it around with you. And there were like three cities in the US. And I think in most countries in the world, there were maybe like three cities in the country where you could use a cell phone. And it was um, first generation, um, which was terrible, terrible. We're on, what are we on? 4G LTE now and 5G is in development now. So uh, it was first generation, and, but almost nobody had a cell phone. Everybody had a landline phone, and if you wanted to call somebody long distance, it was terribly expensive, like 20, 25 cents a minute to call somebody long distance, right? Does that sound good? You didn't want to pay that kind of money, right? If you wanted to call mom, right? That was very expensive to call mom. All right, so 1010220 10, was this great service where they offered you for 99 cents, you could have a 20 minute phone call. How much is that per minute, by the way? Five cents a minute, that's great. That's a great deal, right? Five cents a minute. And then it was 99 cents for the first 20 minutes. And then I think originally it was 15 cents a minute after that. Eventually it came down to 10 cents a minute after that. But remember, the first 20 minutes is five cents a minute. What a great deal, right? So far so good? Okay. And, and here, by the way, is a YouTube link from the commercial. One of the com they had a whole series of these commercials. Uh, you can go watch the commercial and it gives you the business model that they were working from. Now let me ask you a question. Under the 10, 10, 2, 20 business model, what was the cost of a 20 minute phone call? So this is a review question. 99 cents. What was the cost of a 19 minute phone call? Say so what? The same. the same, 99 cents. What was the call of a 15 minute, the cost of a 15 minute phone call? 99 cents. What was the cost of a five minute phone call? 99 cents. What was the cost of a five second phone call? Still 99 cents. Now does it sound like a bargain? Shake your head louder with your mouth. No. Now it sounds like a ripoff, right? How many of you have ever looked at your cell phone bill? Like sort of poured through all the calls on it to see what you did in the past month? Okay. The majority of your calls are what duration? Very short. Yeah, under five minutes typically, right? So let's say three minutes is an average phone call. So 99 cents for three minutes, how much is that? How much are you paying per minute at that point? 33 cents a minute, that's worse than the plan you've got on your phone, on your landline, right? Again, this is a long time ago when we had landline phones. Remember those days? Okay. So a long, long time ago, right? So it sounded like a great bargain until you started thinking carefully about the reality of how you were going to use it. And then it didn't seem so great anymore. Okay, so far good? So fixed charge for making the call at all, and then a per minute charge after some period of time. Now, obviously this is intended to be an analogy for distributed parallelism. So it turns out that that was all on purpose because now you actually understand how distributed parallelism works. So the processes are completely independent of one another, okay? Each one of them, remember we used this term last week, address space. Right? Each one of them has its own private address space, meaning it has its own private variables that none of the other processes can look at, let alone change. Okay? So remember last week we had that thing with the race conditions? Well, you can't have a race condition if all the data are private. So we eliminated that problem, right? Okay. Um, processes communicate by passing messages, by messages, by voicemail, essentially. Okay? And the cost of a message is split between latency, which is the cost of making the connection at all, so that's your 99 cents, and then bandwidth, which is the cost per byte or per bit, cost per unit of data moved. And that's typically expressed as time per unit of data. So cost here means time. Now I actually did the benchmarking and I got my benchmark data this morning because um, I ran it on, gosh, I think it was 600 cores or something. I had to run it on enough compute nodes to guarantee that at least one of them was not in the same rack as all the others. So we have 27 per rack. So I had to run it on 28 compute nodes to guarantee there'd be no overlap, okay, uh, or to guarantee maximal distance. And what I found was, um, and this was using a benchmark called LLC Bench, uh, so you can look that up on the web. What I found was the latency on our cluster supercomputer today is about one and a quarter microseconds. 
So the time it takes, another way to think of it is the time it takes for a message of length zero to get from here to there. Okay. It's not literally a message of length zero, it's like four bytes long, but that should be the same idea. Okay. So about one and a quarter microseconds. The bandwidth was um, almost the full bandwidth of the, of the particular flavor of the switch we have. Um, it's a 40 gigabit switch. I'm getting 37.2 gigabits per second out of that. So that's pretty good. Okay. All right. So that means that per bit, it takes about a quarter of a tenth of a nanosecond. So 0.027 nanoseconds per bit. That's basically just that, one over that. Okay. So what that means is it takes the first bit 1260 nanoseconds to get from one place to another, but the last bit takes 0.027 nanoseconds. That's a difference of a factor of 47,000. So that's like having a long distance plan where it's $470 just to make the connection, and then one cent a minute after you've been on the phone for a month. Now, if you have that long distance plan, are you going to call mom every night? No, you are not. No, you will call her on Christmas and leave the phone off the hook until New Year's, right? Because you've already paid the $470. You might as well get your money's worth. Right? You're going to call mom once a year at that point. Your incentive now is to minimize the number of calls you make and to maximize the amount of data you push through the call. So you're going to have a long conversation with mom about everything you can think of. Okay. So all of that is to introduce you to MPI, the message passing interface. So MPI actually really is a standard. So we talked about this last week, the notion of a standard. MPI is a standard for expressing computing processes, leaving voicemails for, and getting voicemails from each other, passing messages. And it consists of three things, or an implementation of MPI consists of three things. A header file, so a bunch of declarations and whatnot. A library of routines that you call to actually pass the messages, and a runtime environment. So it turns out when you run an MPI program, you don't run an MPI program. You literally never run an MPI program. But you need to run MPI programs because MPI programs are super important and valuable and really fast, right? But you never actually run the MPI program. What you do instead is you run a program that runs your MPI program. So on most systems, not all, but on most systems, there's a program called MPI run, and you say MPI run and the name of your executable, and that runs your executable, but you don't run your executable directly. That will fail. All right. So you compile if you've got access to, if your code has MPI calls in it, um, and you don't have MPI on your machine, then your compile will fail. If you do have MPI, then it properly links to the beautiful MPI library now from running. The MPI standard only covers Fortran C and C++, and um, actually, as we'll see in a second, the C++ part is somewhat of a cheat. Um, there are unofficial bindings for other languages, like MATLAB and Python. Uh, R is another one, um, but um, they're not officially part of the MATLAB standard. Or, sorry, the MPI standard. Okay. Um, and for some of them, there are multiple different ones. Um, all sort of independent of each other. Okay, so this is what a typical MPI call looks like. Uh, the, um, it always starts with MPI in all uppercase and an underscore, and then the first character of the rest of the name will also be uppercase. And then you'll have some list of arguments, and it will return an integer code that represents the error. And there is a special magical constant called MPI success. If what it returns is MPI success, then it worked. If it returns anything other than MPI success, then it didn't work. In Fortran, it looks a little different. I'm not sure I understand why. It's not like Fortran doesn't um, allow you to have a function that returns an integer value, but okay, whatever. So you say call and the name of the function. Um, Fortran is case insensitive, so you don't have to worry about whether it's upper or lower case. I like to do it that way anyway, just for good habits. And the last argument to the function in Fortran, the last argument will be the integer that's going to capture the error code. All right, uh, blah, 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 I already said all that. The C++ binding has been deprecated. This means, although in theory you can use it, they suggest you don't use it. Instead, if you're gonna use um, MPI in a C++ code, you should use the C binding, not use the C++ binding. In the olden days, I would tell you, before this was deprecated, 
I would tell you don't use this anyway because it's under testing because it's not used that much. Nowadays, they said, they essentially threw up their hands. And they said, you know, we're putting a lot of work into maintaining the C++ binding, and it's not being used very much. It's a total waste of time. Let's just switch over to that. It's no big deal. All right. Uh, MPI is an API, an application programming interface, which means it's really a description of that list of functions, subroutines, whatever you want to call them, that, that list of procedures. So what their arguments are and what those mean and what the behavior should be. And I should say most APIs, especially APIs that are intended to be portable across different kinds of computers and different operating systems, most APIs have a lot of room in them for you to decide, you the implementer, or the person implementing that API, to decide specifically how it's gonna get implemented. So there's lots of different, thing, different ways that it can be implemented and still comply with the standard. Uh, there are a lot of implementations of MPI. The first three of them are generic. They can be used across many different kinds of platforms. Um, uh, well, the first two anyway. Uh, oh, I left one off, which is mVantage. Uh, I didn't mean to leave that off. I intended to leave it. But then there are some that are specific to um, a CPU type or an operating system or even something even more specific than that, a vendor. There's lots and lots of them. Okay. So in theory, MPI, the standard provides bindings for C, C++, I mentioned that's already deprecated, Fortran 77 and Fortran 90. My recommendation is you pretend that C, the C++ and Fortran 90 bindings don't exist. And you just do it purely with C and Fortran 77. The reason I say that is Fortran, of course, C++ now is deprecated. But even before that, again, it was underused and therefore under-tested. Um, the reason that, for example, Ethernet works really well and is very robust is because it's gotten a huge amount of testing all over the world all day every day. Whereas uh, the Fortran 90 binding, yes, question from TV Land. What do standards contain? What do standards, standards contain? Dis, a standard contains a description of the parts of a thing. So in the case of MPI, a list of these of the procedures. So MPI send, MPI receive, MPI reduce, all of these sorts of things. What their arguments are, that is what you pass to them, um, and what their behavior is, how they're supposed to operate. That's what a standard typically contains. And that's what MPI in particular contains. Um, so, so avoid the C++ and Fortran 90 bindings. They are poorly tested. Okay, now this is the top six MPI routines. If you know these, you understand enough to follow the most important bits of any MPI code, and more importantly, you can learn the rest pretty straightforwardly once you've mastered these. And these aren't that bad. So MPI init means I am an MPI program, let's get started. And every MPI program starts by calling MPI init. MPI finalize is sort of the opposite of that. I'm done being an MPI program, shut me down. Okay. Um, so every MPI program ends with MPI finalize. By the way, I'm exaggerating and oversimplifying a little bit, but let's keep that as close enough to true. MPI com size and MPI com rank. Com size, how many of us are there? MPI com rank, which of us am I? Okay. Um, so rank here means among the N of us, which of the N of us am I? So if there are 12 of us, I could be number zero or number one or number two, dot, 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 or I could be number 11. So my rank would be between zero and however many there are of us. Okay. And then the two that actually do anything interesting, and by the way, every MPI program should check how many of us are there and who am I. Okay. And then um, MPI send, send a message from me to someone else. And MPI receive, get a message from someone else to me. So this is leave a voicemail for someone, pick up a voicemail from someone. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, now, there are others. Those are the top six, but then here are some other ones that are pretty important. Bcast, short for broadcast. I don't know why they just didn't spell it out, call it broadcast, but there it is. So it broadcasts a message. So that means one of us tells the rest of us some important piece of information, um, which could be little, like a single integer, or it could be huge, like a giant 3D array. 
MPI reduce, remember what a reduction is, turning lots of data into fewer data. So MPI reduce performs a reduction among many processes. Or it could be many. Okay? Um, so turn many into few, um, and, and we'll see pictures of that presently. Gather. So everybody is going to give a piece of the information to one of us that one of us will end up with all of the information. Scatter, one of us has all the information and will give a piece of that information to each of us. Okay. All right, so here is the structure of more or less any MPI program. Okay. Um, this is the C version. I've got the Fortran version here. It's, oh, I don't have the Fortran version. All right, Fortran version looks similar. Okay. Go ahead, Fortran. All right, so I've got to declare who am I, how many of us are there, and my error code. So MPI error code gets MPI init. Uh, those of you who are not C programmers or are not familiar with error C and error B, these are um, the command line arguments. So if you type a command, you know, blah, A, B, C, or whatever, then it, this is going to be the A, B, C. Okay? Um, usually, we're not going to even use these, but some programs like to. Okay, um, com rank, how many of us, oh, sorry, who am I, right? Um, Com size, how many are there of us? And then this is where you would put the actual work. And then down here is MPI finalized. And typically, this is not always true, but typically the call to MPI finalize is the last thing in the main program. Okay. Just as the call to MPI init is the first thing in the main program. Again, that's not invariably true, but it's usually a good idea. Okay. Now, I introduced to you a fun acronym, SPIMD. SPIMD, single program, multiple data, every process will run the same program, run the same executable, but each one of us gets a different rank and we'll decide what portion of the work to do based on what our rank is. Okay? And we'll see an example of that presently. Okay? That way, we don't have to worry about everybody getting a different executable, which would be really hard to do, especially because we often don't know before we compile the code how many processes we're going to run. So then having a different executable for every process would be super difficult. Now, by the way, I've actually seen someone do this, where they have different executables for different processes. It's insane. You can make it work, but it's really hard to make it work, and it's a terrible idea. But I have seen someone do it. So I'm going to give you kind of the stripped down, simplest MPI program that we can to capture how MPI behaves. So this is hello world, and all that's going to happen is every process is going to output hello world. But I'll also have every out process output who they are. Okay. So, and how this is going to work is we'll start up MPI. What, what uh, uh, procedure will we call to start MPI? MPI init, good. We'll get the rank and the number of processes. What are the procedures for the rank and the number of processes? MPI com rank and? Yeah, it, 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 they don't call it MPI com number of processes, unfortunately. MPI com size is the other one. Good. So we'll call both of those. Then we'll just output using printf, or if it's for print, print, we'll just output hello world with. Uh, my rank and number of processes in the output, so we know that we, who set it, and then we'll shut down. What do we call to shut down MPI? Okay. MPI finalized. Exactly correct. Good. Okay, so you're ready for this. Okay, there won't be a lot of shots here. All right, so here we go. So here's number of processes, my rank, and the error code. Right. Here's my call to MPI init. Here's my call to com rank, com size. Here's the printf, and it's just going to output. So if I'm rank zero of twelve. It'll say zero of 12, hello world, right? That's it. And then MPI finalized. So this is pretty much the simplest MPI code you can write. Okay, not a lot of, not a lot of um, meat going on in this particular code, right? And here's the Fortran version. See how nice to give you the Fortran. Okay, same idea. Um, I had to make it, I had to use the continuation characters here, these ampersands, because I can't it on the page unless I make the font really tiny and then you have trouble reading it. So that didn't seem nice, so I didn't do that to you. Um, but it's basically doing exactly the same thing as the C version. And here I do the run. I, I decided I wanted to fit this all on one page and still have it be legible, so 
I split it into two columns. But you notice this is coming out in completely random order, right? There are 20 of them, but there's 20 of them in totally random order. And if I run it again, it'll come out in the same order. No, it'll come out in a totally new order. And every time I run it, it'll be a totally new order. How many orderings are there of 20 different things? 20 factorial, 20 times 19 times 18 times dot, dot, dot times 2 times 1, which is a honking big number. That number is going to be, I don't know, uh, quintillions maybe? I don't know, something. It's a huge number of different orders this can come out in. And it'll randomly come out in one of those orders, right? Probably never get the same thing twice. OK, now we'll go on to another and a more complicated one. Are we ready for more complicated code? All right. So this one's going to behave the same at the beginning and the end. So it'll start MPI by calling MPI init. It'll call MPI com rank and MPI com size to get who am I and how many of us are there. And down at the end, it's going to call MPI finalize. Right? So that's old friend. Okay, the stuff in the middle is more interesting. One of the processes will be what we call the server. So it's going to sort of orchestrate what's going on. And the other processes are going to be called the clients. And they're going to do the work. So far, so good? Okay. So if I'm not a server, meaning I'm, a, I'm a, a client, then I'm going to create a string that has my greeting. So it won't literally say hello world. It'll say greetings from and then my, uh, my rank. And then I will send that as an MPI message, as a voicemail, to the server. If I'm the server, then I'll loop over all of the clients, and I'll get the greeting from that client and then print it out. I'll have so first, good. So that's the basic structure. And I stole this from a wonderful book by a fellow named Peter Pacheco. And I can't remember the title of the book, but I, I have a reference there. It's basically something like MPI programming. It's a textbook. It's wonderful. Um, and it's, gosh, it's old now. It's like from the 1990s or something. It's a great book. And MPI, uh, th at this level, MPI is still pretty much the same. So the book is still quite good. All right, so here are the declarations. Um, I need to know how long the string can be, so I've got a named constant for that. Um, the server is going to have rank zero, and I'll talk about that in a few minutes. Okay. I've got the character string that's going to hold the message. Okay. Um, this MPI status variable, I'm, I'm going to pretend doesn't exist. We're not going to talk about it, but you have to have it for receiving data. Okay. And I've got my rank and number of processes. Source. So where the message is coming from, destination, where the message goes to. I'll talk about tag presently. So don't worry about that yet. And then, of course, our old friend MPI here. Okay, so we're ready? All right, now, startup and shutdown should look very familiar, right? So I call MPI init, MPI com rank, MPI com size. That's what I should do at the beginning of an MPI program. At the end, I call MPI finalize. In between is the important part of the program. And notice I've got, if I'm not the server, then do the following. Otherwise, do the following. Okay. And we haven't yet worked out what those are, because I can't fit them all on one screen. Okay. So let's talk about what the clients, the, the ones who are not the server, what the clients do. They create a string named message whose contents is reading from process number whatever, right? which is my rank, whoever I am. And they set the destination to the server, which is rank zero. And then they send, okay, send, send the message whose length is this many, uh, in this case it would be characters, okay, this many characters, send it to there, and notice I set destination to server, which is zero, okay. I haven't talked about tag yet, so for now you're accepting it on faith. And then I haven't talked about MPI com world or communicators yet, so for now you're accepting it on faith. <coughs> so far so good? Okay. Now, if I am the server, then I'm going to loop over all of the processes. I'll skip over myself, because I'm not going to send myself a message. Okay. Everybody else is sending me messages. So I'm skipping over myself. I'm going to receive a message from them. I don't know how long it's going to be, but I know the maximum length it could be. So I'll make sure it's not longer than that. It's data type character. Okay. Uh, here's who it's coming from. Again, we're not talking about tags or communicators yet. And then here's that status variable that I said that's pretend it doesn't exist. Okay. All right. And then I'll output that. Okay. I'll output what was sent to me. 
Okay, so again, this is single program multiple data. Everybody's running the exact same program. They're just doing different things with it depending on their rank. Okay. So each one of them says, who am I? That is, they call MPI com rank. And they look at the value of my rank or whatever variable name they're using. And they say, oh, I'm rank zero. I guess I'm the server. I'll do server things. Or they say, oh, I'm rank five. I'm not the server. So I'll do client things, right? Okay. And they're all executing totally independently of each other, except for the voicemail, except for passing messages. Okay? That's the only place where the interact is on passing messages. So that's good. Now, by the way, on most supercomputers today, you do not run the way I'm showing you. So I said earlier, you never run an MPI program. You run an MPI program that runs an MPI program. And I'm showing you that here. MPI run, number of, pro number of processors is four, and then the name of the executable, in this case, readings MPI. But in real life, you don't actually do this. Instead, you create a batch script that describes how you're going to run the program. And you submit that batch script to the batch scheduler. So you run a program that runs a program to run your program. Is that enough levels of indirection? Okay. I mention that now so you don't get confused and think this is what you should do when you get to somebody else's supercomputer. If, if you own your own supercomputer, then you can do this. If you're using somebody else's, then you don't do this as a general rule. And by the way, if you own a supercomputer of your own and nobody else gets to use it, then you can do this. If you share it with more than one other person, then you're going to end up doing the thing I just described. Why? Oh, um, because you and the other person both want to use all of it all the time. And so you'll both be trying to run MPI programs on the same processors at the same time. At best, you'll run super slow. At worst, you'll crash the supercomputer. Neither one of those is going to be a win. So instead, you use the batch schedule to decide when you actually get to run and on what parts of the supercomputer. And that keeps you from colliding and wrecking either your runs, which is bad enough, or the supercomputer, which is much worse. You can compile um, from the command line, but you typically are not running from the command line. OK, now, you see here, when I run on one process, I get no output. Why would that be? Why don't I get any output if I run on one process? Server. Because the server doesn't output anything. Well, that's not true. The server outputs everything, but it's, it outputs everybody else's thing. It doesn't generate a message of its own. It outputs everybody else's message. Okay, I run on two processors. I get one output because the server, rank zero, doesn't output its own thing. It only outputs everybody else's thing. If I run on three, I get two outputs. If I run on four, I get three outputs. If I ran on 87 processes, how many outputs would I get? 86, exactly correct. Good. Now notice that they come out in deterministic order. They come out sorted. Remember when we did Hello World? I'll roll back here. They came out in random order. And there were 20 factorial different orders that these 20 messages could come out in, which we said was probably quintillions or something, right? Lots and lots of different ways that the data could come out. But here they're coming out in the same order every time. Let's figure out why. Okay. We'll get there in a minute. First, why is it that rank zero is the server? How did we pick that? Do what? It, it is, but it turns out that that's not really that important. I mean, what you say is literally true as a general rule, but it's unimportant. There's actually a much more important reason. So what do we know? No matter how many processes I run on, what ranks are guaranteed to be there? Zero is always there, right? Because, by the way, can I run on negative seven processes? No, there's no such thing. How about, can I run on zero processes? If I run on zero processes, am I running? No, so can I run on zero processes? No, what's the minimum number of processes I can run on? One. If I run on one, what are the ranks of the, of the one process? Zero. So zero is guaranteed to be there, right? 
There's another one that's guaranteed to be there. Number of processes minus one. Whatever the number of processes is. So if there's 12 processes, 11 is guaranteed to be there. If there's 90 processes, 89 is guaranteed to be there. But if I don't know how many processes there are before I run, I can't say that process 11 is guaranteed to be there, because after all, if I run on eight processes, there's no process 11. The advantage of zero is it's a constant, right? And it's easier to handle, right? It, it writes a lot more compact, right? Zero is one character, whereas number of processes minus one is a bit more cumbersome. So typically, when one of the processes is special in some way, that process is ranked zero, typically. It's, it's not required to be. It could be a random process, but typically it's ranked zero. Does there have to be a server? Do you have to use this one of you um, orchestrates and the rest of you do stuff? Is that the only way to do MPI? Is there always a boss? No, there doesn't have to be a boss. Everybody can be equal. And in fact, I would argue there are more applications where everybody is equal than there are where one of you is the boss. Now, I'm slightly lying. Because in many cases, all of us are equal except one of us does a little bit of extra stuff. And guess who it is who usually ends up doing a little bit of extra stuff? Rank zero, exactly correct. Good. So like there's a little bit of small scale IO or maybe at the beginning you have some weird startup stuff that you have to do. Typically it's rank zero that's gonna end up doing it. But that doesn't mean rank zero is in charge. That just means that rank zero got stuck with a little bit of extra and again, we pick rank zero because that's really easy to express and it's guaranteed to be. So why don't we use the term rank? So it seems like we ought to have called this the process, not the rank, right? I think what the MPI people were trying to do, the people who designed MPI, I think what they were trying to do was not to create that confusion, not to overload the notion of a process because Unix, has its own notion of what a process is. And they didn't want to get into that whole business. So instead, they said, all right, we're just going to call it something different. They picked rank. If I were guessing, I think they picked rank because of the meaning of rank in linear algebra, meaning like how many rows of your matrix have non zeros in them, right? That's the rank of the matrix. Throw away the rows and just have zeros, et cetera, et cetera. That's probably where it comes from. I won't swear to that, but that's probably more. I don't think it came from the military notion of rank, although that is possible. Okay. All right. So we already talked about this. This is how we compile and run. Except that's not how we run, because we run more indirectly than that. Okay. So then why is it that unlike Hello World, where everything came out in random order? 10, 15 minutes. Okay, great. Why is it that here everything comes out in this nice, clean, deterministic? The answer is because we're not answering the phone in the order that the messages arrive, we're answering the phone in the order we feel like. Okay. We're getting our voicemails in the order we want to, not the order that they show up. And the proof of that is we're looping through the different processes. And we're just, I will wait until the message from rank two shows up before I go on to get the message from rank three. And if rank three showed up much earlier than rank two, well, it's just going to wait until rank two shows up. I don't care what, what, this is ignoring the order that they're showing up and instead using the order that I felt like setting. So it's always going to come out in the order that I set up. And by the way, in this case, I, since I stole this from Pacheco's book, in this case, I is Peter Pacheco. Okay. So far so good? All right. So the issue is this, that we've got source, and source is going from zero on up. Now remember, we're skipping zero. Source not equal to server. Server is zero. So we're skipping zero, but one, two, three, four, five, and so on. Okay. It's doing it in order. If I wanted it to go in a non-deterministic order, then I can use this, uh, let's call it a name constant. It's actually a macro. I can use this constant MPI any source. And then, even then, by the way, that doesn't guarantee that it comes out in the order in which they showed up. 
It could come in some other order because it could be that by the time I get done outputting uh, rank 12, ranks 6, 4, and 18 have showed up. And I'm going to randomly end up with one of those. And they might have come out in a different order from what I end up outputting. So it's sort of double non-deterministic. Yeah. How many of you remember paper letters? Like you'd send them to someone's address using a stamp. How many of you remember those? Okay. A long time ago, before we had this newfangled email, we had paper letters. So if you send someone a paper letter, is the only thing you send them the paper letter? No, what do you send them? The yeah, the envelope. And what do you put on the envelope? What kind of information? Be specific. You put a stamp. I paid for this. Good. What else? Okay, so the, the, um, the sender's address, which we nowadays call the return address, right? In case I can't get it there, who do I send it back to? Right? So the, the source. What else? Yes, the destination, the recipient address. Good. Okay. So um, MPI is the same thing. You only write the letter you're sending. But when you do the MPI call, MPI sort of wraps some extra data around it that we can think of as morally equivalent to an envelope. Um, so it says different things from what you put on an envelope when you send a paper letter, but the principle is the same. So in the case of an MPI send, you've got how many, um, I think it's typically expressed as how many instances of that data type do you send, not how many bytes. It's actually how many instances of the data type. Who is sending it? where it's going, who it's going to, the tag, which again, we haven't talked about yet, and then the communicator, which we also haven't talked about yet. Okay. We'll get to those in a minute. Yeah, excited? Data types. This is not an exhaustive list. These are just the most popular. Okay. So uh, if you're doing C or C++, if you, are, if you want to send a care, it's MPI underscore care. Likewise, in Fortran, of whatever version. If you want to send a character, it's MPI underscore character, and so on. So the data type, the MPI data type, is just in all uppercase the name of the data type with MPI underscore in front. Okay, very straightforward. Okay. And again, there are tons of other ones, but the MPI language, the MPI standard, only has definitions for the ones that are built into the language. So I believe there is, for example, MPI long int and MPI short int, which are actual C data types. Um, and there's MPI logical on the Fortran side, which is an actual Fortran data type. And you can actually have, I think most MPI implementations do have MPI long double, which I think was only, only very recently became part of the C standard, 10 minutes. Okay. I'm not going to get through everything, but that's fine. Okay. Um, so there's lots of others. That's the actual answer. All right, tags. So I have a multi-religious family, okay? So I'm Jewish, she's Christian, so the kids get to be both. And my elder kid was born in December. So now, by the way, we try really hard to make sure she gets a birthday party because it's really mean when you were born in December, you don't get a birthday party, right? We don't want to be mean, so we try to be nice. So how does she know? If I hand her a present any time in December, how does she know what that's the present for? What's on the present so that she knows? There's a tag, right? And on the tag, maybe like if it's, if it's a birthday present, it's got a little cake with candles on it, right? Or a little picture, right? Or, or if it's uh, Christmas, it's got like a Christmas tree, or if it's Hanukkah, it's got a little menorah or a cradle or something, right? And so by based on what little symbol is on the tag, she can tell what kind of present it is, okay? Well, so the same thing applies to messages. If I'm gonna send a message, I'm gonna leave you a voicemail. You not only wanna know where it came from, but you wanna know what kind of message it is because there could be many different kinds of messages flying around all at the same time. So by having a tag, we can say, this is message kind seven. And what that means, that depends on what you decide it means, right? You decide what the meaning of the messages are, of the tags are. 
But then you go looking for a message of type 7 or a message of type 12 or a message of type 5, right? whatever that means. And you've set up some meaning to those messages, OK? All right, uh, we already talked about that. OK, now, communicators. I promised you that I would talk about that too. Hey, we're actually doing pretty good on slides. We might get through them all. Oh, that's so exciting. All right. So most of the time when you're running an MPI program, you want to run that program on all of the processes and do all the stuff everywhere, because that's going to get you your best performance, right? If you looked at Amdahl's law, you want to parallelize as much of the code as you can, and you want to run it on as many processes as you can get your hands on, right? So most of the time you're using everything, and so you're just going to use the default, what we call a communicator. So communicator is a collection of processes, could be all of them, could be a subset of them, within a run. And then we can define things like tags that are associated with that communicator. And one of the reasons we want to do that is so that I can write an amazing library of functions to do some incredible thing. And then you can download that library, and you can link your code to it. You can call my functions, which are amazing, because I get paid a lot of money to write that code. They do amazing stuff. And your MPI messages won't crash into mine, right? Because my MPI messages are going to have a set of tags that I came up with, and your MPI messages are going to have a set of tags that you came up with. And I can't promise you that I didn't pick the same numbers that you picked. We might both have picked tag seven to be a particular kind of message. So if I have my own communicator with its own set of tags and so on, then I can guarantee that my messages and your messages won't conflict, right? So even though I've got tag seven and you've got tag seven in the part of your code that knows your stuff, and then you call my code, we won't conflict because my seven is not the same as your seven. It's in a different community. So you can create a communicator. I don't know if I have a picture of that. No, I didn't have a picture of that. Okay. You can create your own communicator, or I can create a communicator, and you can use my code. Okay. Broadcast. I mentioned this before. Every one of us, uh, sorry, I have information none of you have. I give it all to, you, to all of you. Okay. Now, in real life, when we broadcast, we think of I send the thing out. I broadcast to all of you, and all of you receive my broadcast. Well, unfortunately, that doesn't fit how MPI likes to do stuff. So what MPI does is something that's counterintuitive. Everybody calls MPI bcast. And after everybody has called MPI bcast, we all have the same information that one of us had originally. It's counterintuitive. You'd think I would call MPI bcast and you'd all call MPI set, uh, receive. But no, we all call MPI bcast. So this says what the data is, how many of them there are, what the data type is, um, who is sending it, and what's the communicator that we're sending it on. Okay. So. And by the way, this is generally, uh, and I'll do an example of this, um, what we call collective communication. Five minutes left? I might go a little over, but I think we're pretty close. Um, collective communications, um, generally, what we find is everybody calls the same routine at the same time in more or less the same way. Okay, so here's a picture of using broadcast. This is our standard skeleton. Um, just, I've got an array here and some length, okay. Uh, a server is gonna input some, some length and it's gonna allocate an array and then fill it up with junk. In this case, I just filled it with zeros, but it could be anything, right? It could be useful data, that would be the ideal, right? Okay. Then, Assuming there's more than one of us. So only, if there's only one of us, is there any point in broadcasting? No. Can I run an MPI run on one process? Sure. So do I need to make sure I check? Do I need to take care of that? Now, by the way, some implementations of MPI, if there's only one of us, I can still call MPI bcast, and it basically just doesn't do anything. However, not all implementations of MPI handle that nicely. My recommendation is that you assume that that will fail. So you only do it if there's more than one, which is what I did here. Okay, so we all call MPI bcast for the length, how many elements there are in the array, okay? Then 
the server had already allocated space for the array. You can see that up here. But if I'm not the server, I haven't allocated space for the array yet, because up until vcast, I didn't know how long it was going to be. Okay. So now I can allocate the array. Okay. Now we call we all call vcast, and the server sends everybody the contents of the whole array, the useful, interesting data. Okay. And now just as a check, I'm going to output something, make sure that worked. Okay. So compile run again. You, in real life, you have to do it through batch script. Okay. Broadcast length. They all end up with the same result. Okay, everybody's happy. Yes, question from TV Land. Yes, open MP seems much easier for many parallel opportunities. Open MP seems easier to use. So let me answer that question in two ways. Yes and no. So yes, open MP is superficially easier to learn. Um, the difficulty is because it's shared memory, it is fraught with peril because of race conditions, as we saw last week. Okay. Whereas MPI, although it is very cumbersome to write MPI code, it's a really clumsy way to express this kind of parallelism. It's ugly. You can never remember what the order of the arguments for any particular MPI routine are, so you have to always go look them up on the web, right? It's a pain to use, but it's much safer. And so this actually sort of creates an interesting teacher's dilemma. Do I teach you shared memory parallelism first and then MPI, or do I teach you MPI first and then shared memory? And I will tell you that in real life, if I'm genuinely going to teach you to write the code, as opposed to we're just sort of learning the basic ideas, I would teach you MPI first. And I've done this in the past. Because it's a lot easier to go from distributed parallelism where it's safe if clumsy and cumbersome, to shared memory parallelism, where it looks easy, but bugs are, are very subtle and very hard to track, to track down. So I, I actually, if, if, if you ask me what I want to write the parallel code in, I want to write it in MPI, even though MPI is ugly. I still want to write it in MPI, because in MPI, I'm much less likely to introduce the exciting kinds of bugs that you get in OpenMPI. All right, reductions. We've talked about this multiple times. A reduction is turning many data into few data. MPI actually has two reduction routines. It has reduce and all reduce. Reduce means one of us is going to get, let's say, the sum of all the data that all of us sent, or the product of the data, or the minimum or maximum of the data that all of us sent. All reduce is all of us are going to get that result. Okay, why would we have two of them? Why have reduce and all reduce? Let's take a look at a reduce and an all reduce here, just use the PF. Right? This is all old friends. That's an old friend at the bottom, right? This is not there. Okay, okay so I've got a sum here for zero. And then my rank times whatever processes gives me whatever value I'm going to work on. So, you know, uh, if I'm running this on four processes, rank zero will have the value zero, rank one will have the value four, rank two will have the value eight, rank three will have the value 12, right? It doesn't matter what the numbers are. It's just let's see if it works. Okay, MPI reduce. Everybody sends their value. This is what it gets summed into. Okay? This is how many we're, how many sums we're working on at a time, data type, the calculation we're doing, which is the MPI sum, um, who's going to get the result, and then, of course, our community. Okay? And everybody calls this at the same time. We're out of time? OK, I'll, I'll wrap up in a minute or two. OK, um, so great. And then all reduce, same idea, except we don't say who's going to get the result because all of us are going to get the result. Okay. All right. So I'll run. When I just do reduce, I get zero. Oh, three gets zero, one gets zero, two gets zero. But zero, rank zero, who was getting the result, right? So here is server, which has rank zero. Okay. Gets the result, and it gets the result 20. What was that, 12 plus 8 plus 4? Oh, it worked. OK, good. But then when I call all reduce, everybody gets the result. OK, so why have both? Well, it turns out that if you only have to send the result to one of us, that takes less time than sending it to all of us. So we have both because sometimes all of us need the answer, in which case we'll spend the time getting the answer to all of us. But if only one of us needs the answer, why waste time? 
because time is funny. Exactly correct. Good. Okay. Non-blocking communication. Oh, we're almost done. That's great. Okay. Non-blocking communication. Um, so in MPI, if I call MPI set, for example, and you call MPI receive, then my call to MPI send doesn't get to return back to my code, doesn't get to be done until the data gets to you. I wait patiently until you get the data. This can create all kinds of fascinating effects. By the way, it's actually way more complicated than that. I've oversimplified, but to first order, that's true. But if I don't want to, because what's the problem with me waiting until you get the data? It takes, yeah, because time is money, right? It takes more time. It's slow. Exactly correct. Good. Um, what's the advantage of waiting until you get the message? Huh? It's safe. Exactly correct. So it's a trade-off between cost and safety. Exactly correct. If I'm willing to make that trade-off, then there's another set of routines, MPI I send and MPI I receive, that I call MPI I send. It doesn't wait for you to get the message. It immediately returns from that call. That's what the I is for, immediate. It immediately returns from the call, and the message is flying out through space on its way to you. And in the meantime, I can go off and do other work. Okay. Oops. Okay. So I have MPI I send, MPI I receive. And then when I want to make sure that you got the message, because I better double check and make sure before, for example, I send the same message the next time. Then I call MPI wait. And that'll make sure I stop to make sure you get the message. And the advantage of that is now I can do what's called communication hiding, which means while the message is flying around from me to you, I can be getting work done. And so I'll save time that way. But what do I give up? It's unsafe. If I write the code well, it will be safe, but I have to write the code a lot more carefully. And that's it. Okay, so remember, we're out for two weeks, the 13th and the 20th. We're back here on, on the 27th, the last Tuesday of March. Uh, same time, same station. We look forward to seeing you all. Thanks so much, folks.